Okay, this video is chapter 8b, the second half of the chapter on diabetes, and we're going to keep on moving into more advanced stuff, and I think you're going to find a lot of this material new. Uh, some of it, the, in, the beginning of it will be stuff you might have heard before if you watch the internet videos, but then we'll start moving into more and more new stuff for the whole rest of the book. Okay, um, so with diabetes, I'll tell you something a little interesting. I wanted to become very knowledgeable about it. I was especially interested in why do people become demented, and I noticed, you know, over 90% of my demented patients were all diabetics. So um, I read everything I could. I read all the regular paperback books. I read all the nutrition experts, McDougal, Bernard, Gregor, Pritikin, uh, Ornish, et cetera, et cetera, about Kempner, his work, et cetera, et cetera. And then I read through a bunch of papers on diabetes. I went through all the textbooks. And I figured, okay, now I want to talk to one of the experts. So I asked some nurses I know and doctors, who are the best diabetes experts in the area where I live, from the universities? And I went and I met with them. Okay, I met with three uh, so-called experts in diabetes. And I started asking them, what do you think of the Sweeney paper? What do you think of the Hemsworth paper? You know, what do you think of Shellman? What do you think of Taylor? They hadn't read any of them, none of them. I couldn't believe it. And they started asking me goofy things like, oh, you want to live to be 100? It's sort of silliness. And what I'm trying to say is they're trained to match the yield of the pill and send a bill. They know the drugs. But they really don't have an interest in all this nutrition and pathophysiology. And that's why people routinely go to universities and they get recommended things that are not wise. You know, things like Mediterranean diet, count your carbs, all that nonsense. So anyways, kind of it comes down to the same point again. If you want to get optimal health results, you need to educate yourself to get standard of care, which is good enough in some things. In some things, standard of care equals optimal care. But for diabetes, you know, a lot of diabetes patients are cognitively slow, cognitively impaired. They're really not capable of helping themselves. But for someone who is able to read and change their behavior, you get dramatically better results. And it's pretty obvious once you start studying if you optimize your diet, go low-fat uh, vegan. Okay, so anyways, uh, some of these papers, we'll really quickly review them. Dr. McDougall's got a good lecture on this. You know, back in the 1920s, a researcher named J. Shirley Sweeney took a bunch of medical students and he just fed them a high-fat diet for two days and they all failed their oral glucose tolerance test. Okay, it was obvious the fat was causing. You feed them carbohydrates, they don't fail their oral glucose tolerance test. Um, the 1930s through 1970s, lots of researchers got the same results, you know, little permutations of it. Rabinowich is a famous one, Hemsworth, and of course Kempner. Kempner treated about 19,000 patients, and he showed all kinds of incredible things. Besides getting their blood pressure down for the 200s down to normal, he had patients, uh, you know, reverse their diabetic retinopathy. Okay, rather incredible. Uh, Pritikin and McDougall had lots of patients come off all their insulin and their diabetic medications. That's well known, and other researchers have shown the same thing. Bernard has shown that in his research, and there's been plenty of other ones who've shown the same thing. Okay, and then later on we'll talk about Roy Taylor, and he had incredible results of uh, getting patients to lose about 20 pounds or more weight. And, you know, all patients with type 2 less than four years, they all came off uh, their diabetic medications when he did that. These guys all did great work, but the best paper ever written on diabetes was written by a guy named Michael Brownlee. He's a physician from United States. I think he's out in the New York area. And this guy's paper was so beautiful. So I'm trying to become an expert on diabetes and I'm reading everything and there's so many crappy papers there's so much BS and it's a lot of work and then when I came across his paper it's like I almost wanted to cry it was so intellectually beautiful it was just a work of genius um, and you know like I said he studied diabetes as if his life depended on it because it did he was a type 1 diabetic himself and uh, the guy's a genius and he wanted to figure it out to save himself and he did um, in 2004, he won the Banting Award, and his paper was, as the best diabetes researcher in the world, his paper is called The Pathobiology of Diabetic Complications, a Unifying Mechanism. It was published in a diabetes journal in June of 2005. If you go to the ADA.org site, American Diabetic Association, you can read the paper for free. You can actually watch a video of him lecturing about it, but you do have to sign in to do that. Um, here's the PubMed citation for the article, and one of the things I think is a little bit funny here, let me get to it is that there's no abstract available. And you will often see that as the case when, you know, Big Farmer doesn't want low-life proles and the riffraff like you and me looking at uh, the secrets. They don't want everybody to know about what really happens in diabetes. So here's the paper, no abstract available. Um, all right. So then here it is if you go to diabetes.org, the pathobiology of diabetic complications, a unifying mechanism. All right. And this paper, it's just so incredible. Uh, it, it's just beautiful. Um, 
All right, so what's the key point? The key point was excessive dietary fat will cause reversal of electron transport. It's especially saturated fat, and I think the reason why saturated fat is more associated with causing resistance than other types of fat is because, you know, it's saturated, okay, with hydrogens, meaning that there's no double bonds in it. When there's, a double, when there's no double bonds in it, there's an additional met metabolic beta oxidation step that generates more electron cap carriers. So more electrons get sent to the inner mitochondrial membrane and they kind of overload it with electron carriers. And then they pump too many protons in the, into the intramembranous space and that creates like a, a pressure gradient, if you will, that the complexes can no longer keep pumping protons in there because the threshold, like you know, negative 160 millivolts, it goes above that. So that's the reason why, that my understanding, saturated fat is thought to especially cause insulin resistance more than other types of fat. But other types of fat also lead to insulin resistance. They all do, as far as I'm aware, including beloved olive oil, okay? The best advertised overhyped thing in the world, you know? They call it extra virgin, as if you're going to marry it, you know, and have a romance with it. I mean, it's ridiculous. Okay, so anyways, this blockage of electron transport leads to, um, leads to, a backup of electron transport in the mitochondria, then a backup of Krebs cycle, then a backup of glycolysis, and that's going to have a whole bunch of consequences. In addition, the electron transport chain starts leaking electrons. For example, coenzyme Q will leak an electron down into oxygen on the, in the inner mitochondrial matrix, and that will then become a reactive oxygen species called superoxide. Superoxide is a free radical, meaning that it has an unpaired electron in its outer orbital, and it's hyperreactive, wants to react with things in its adjacent environment. And under normal conditions, a little bit of this happens all the time every day in every cell. And the body can handle it just fine. It neutralizes it with an enzyme called superoxide dismutase. However, if this happens too much, it can overwhelm the available resources of antioxidants. And then the superoxide can start reacting with other uh, things in the mitochondria and damaging them. Okay, it can also begin to damage DNA, and that will lead to activation of a DNA repair enzyme called PARP, and that ends up being a big deal. Okay, here's just a, another drawing showing a little further along. So, if the superoxides start accumulating, um, they do have some ability to lead to a sequence of events that will damage DNA. You can damage DNA in the mitochondria, you can even damage DNA in the nucleus of the cell, and once this DNA enzyme gets activated, PARP, it can have a mechanism to inhibit glycolysis, especially the glycolytic enzyme, uh, 3-phosphoglyceraldehyde dehydrogenase. Remember when I was talking about 3-PGA, 3-phosphoglyceraldehyde? Uh, when that starts accumulating, all these side reactions will then occur. So this is a real key point in how diabetic complications progress. Okay, so PARP is able to inhibit glycolysis enzyme called 3-PGA. DH, so 3-phosphoglyceraldehyde dehydrogenase. That's 3-PGA-DH. Okay, and so then 3-PGA will accumulate. Okay, so now here's what's going to happen at that point. You don't have to know all this detail. I mean, basically what you need to know is once you inhibit that mitochondria, you cause a traffic jam and everything's all backed up, it basically causes a disaster. Okay, a metabolic disaster. You know, it's sort of like, uh, I'll just show you the next step or two here. It'll be obvious. So glyceraldehyde starts accumulating. When an intermediate in a cycle starts to accumulate into very large amounts, it can start running less favorable side reactions, okay? It'll get converted to diacyl glyceride, glycerol, and then it'll get, um, it'll activate protein kinase C. When protein kinase C is activated, that's going to cause another whole sequence of bad things. But the main one I want to emphasize here is uh, 3-phosphoglyceraldehyde, will then also be converted into MGO. MGO stands for methyl glyoxyl. So you want to know about that, methyl glyoxyl, MGO, because that then has all these advanced glycation end product reactions. It goes around damaging uh, tissues all over the place. Um, okay. All right, so here's a, a little bit of what's happening with... with um, Methyl glyoxyl. See if I can get it exactly right. Oh, I can't. I can't really control how I position it that precisely. We'll go with this. 
Okay, so once 3 phosphoglyceraldehyde dehydrogenase, uh, under, you know, it accumulates because this enzyme's blocked, PARP damages this enzyme. There, I made the X for it being blocked, this enzyme step. Then glyceraldehyde gets, undergoes a side reaction to become methylglyoxal. The methylglyoxal inside the cell will glycate proteins inside the cell and damage them. If you've got glutathione, that can um, detoxify, but a lot of times that's diminished, especially diabetics tend to be low in antioxidants. The methylglyoxal, MGO, can exit the cell and start to glycate extracellular matrix protein like collagen and damage them. Um, it will also uh, react with uh, albumin and form advanced glycation products of that. You can get glycation of hemoglobin A1C. Um, then there's something called the receptor for advanced glycation end products, RAGE, the RAGE receptor. And that will lead to nuclear factor kappa B and a whole bunch of inflammatory cytokines being released, increasing platelet aggregation. So it becomes slightly prothrombotic, hypercoagulable. That's an important point. Anything hypercoagulable is bad because hypercoagulability predisposes to atherosclerosis, blood clots, and occluding vessels. Okay, you also get activation of NOx, NADPH oxidase. So you don't need to know all these steps. What you need to know, though, is a whole bunch of bad things happen when you eat too much dietary fat, especially saturated fat. Okay, so I just wanted to see, just to get a sense of what happens now when you activate protein kinase C. So this was the 3-PGA from glycolysis running a side reaction and becomes DAG, diacylglycerol, and then that activates protein kinase C. Okay, so what happens? You're going to inhibit endothelial nitric oxide synthase, so you get vasoconstriction. You also get more predisposition to the platelets aggregating, clotting, so it's prothrombotic, bad. You increase something called endothelin. That's like the opposite of nitro nitric oxide. Again, vasoconstriction, platelet aggregation, more prone to forming clots. Really bad. When you're forming clots in little tiny vessels of your foot, then it leads to amputations. Diabetics get tons of amputations. The most common reason to start amputating toes and feet is from diabetes by far. I and mean, again, every Western hospital has at least one of these on the OR schedule for the day, if not several of them. Okay, um, this... Tissue ischemia can lead to vascular endothelial growth factor being increased in some tissues, like in the eyes, and you get these little abnormal vessels. And um, this is an abnormal, this is bad angiogenesis. There is such a thing as good angiogenesis in the brain in response to exercise, but there's also bad angiogenesis in response to tissue injury and ischemia, hypoxia, lack of oxygen related to diabetes. And you'll start forming blood vessels over the retina, and that can cause decreased vision. That's part of diabetic retinopathy. Okay, and there's more bad stuff. So what I'm basically saying is like let loose the dogs of war, okay? All kinds of bad things happen once you, when you eat excessive amounts of saturated fat, and fat in general, but excessive amounts of saturated fat in particular, okay? So I'm just making that point. The most important thing to know about diabetes is what causes it so you can avoid the thing that causes it. All this other stuff is just, you know, extra detail that you might want to know about if you're curious and maybe it'll motivate you, okay? So it's worth knowing about it. Anyways, if you, if you want to learn more about it, read, read that paper. It's a, it's a masterpiece paper. It's a genius piece of paper. You, like I said, I wanted to cry when I read that paper. I was so happy and I was so, it was just so wonderful. Okay, now here's this other guy, Gerald Shulman, MD, PhD from Yale University. And he won the Banting Award in 2018. And uh, his great research project was they used nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy to confirm that the first detectable finding of insulin resistance was accumulation of fat in the skeletal muscle cell. And they call it IMCL, intramyocellular lipid, okay? Um, and his lecture, you can watch his lecture on YouTube. Just type in Gerald Shulman, you'll see his lecture. And it's, it's a magnificent lecture. Oops. Okay. And once again, too, what does he talk about? He, he kind of emphasizes what he would call the ectopic fat theory. And so, again, it's the idea that fat's accumulating in the skeletal muscle, then it starts, and you get postprandial. That means after eating hyperglycemia. Then it starts accumulating in, in the liver, fatty liver. Fatty liver is like diabetes of the liver. And then the liver loses its ability to accurately sense the blood glucose level, and it tends to run it too high. So now you have fasting hyperglycemia. Um, and so that means your blood glucose is high around the clock. Okay, and eventually you start getting fat accumulation in the pancreas and you start destroying the pancreas. Okay, 
So it's already been known for a long time that fat accumulation is what was causing diabetes, but Shellman sort of proved it beyond all doubt with nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy in the skeletal muscle cells. Okay, then Roy Taylor came along in 2012 and won the Banting Award for showing that all you got to do is get these patients to lose weight, and he documented with MRI of the liver, and when you get them to do that, um, you'll cure them of diabetes, these uh, type 2 diabetics. They were all diagnosed within about four years, so they still had intact um, beta cell ability to make uh, insulin. Okay, and here's listen to what Roy Taylor says. He says, type 2 diabetes is a simple condition of fat excess to which some people are more susceptible than others. So he says people have a fat threshold, meaning that some people can store more fat before they become diabetic than others. All right, so this was from Roy Taylor's research experiment where he showed that you can put an MRI in the liver and estimate the percent of fat in the liver. So at baseline, his patients averaged about 36% of the liver contents were fat. And then when they lost, you know, over 20 pounds of weight, they would drop that liver percent of fat down to like around 2% fat. And um, once their, their fatty liver had resolved, their diabetes would resolve too. So w what he did, he did it, now the way he did it, he put the patients on calorie restriction and these nutrition shakes and other things like that. So I wouldn't really like his diet and I don't think that's a good diet for long term. But for him being able to prove that you could easily you know, cure these type 2 diabetics and reverse it. That's very impressive. Um, and he did a good job of scientifically documenting this. He had worked in the past with Gerald Shulman. So, um, you know, they're both, you know, brilliant genius guys. Okay. And again, what's the best diet to do all this? Go on a low fat, low sodium, whole food, 100% vegan diet. And why do I say low sodium? Because, well, low sodium it helps you avoid being hypertensive. It also avoids vasoconstriction because sodium also inhibits endothelial nitric oxide. I'm going to talk about it in more detail why you should do this in just a little bit. So we'll get to that in a moment. You also should filter your water to get the estrogenic chemicals out of your water. Okay, so here's one of the things that Roy Taylor showed. Basically, as soon as he got the patients to lose weight, their blood glucose just very quickly came down to normal. All right. And it was happening, especially after 20 pounds of weight loss. I was thinking of some patient where 30 pounds or more, and it would happen dramatically so. Okay, um, I'll show you his book. This is his book right here, Life Without Diabetes. It's a very good book. And what he meant with the personal threshold is some people become diabetic, you know, when their BMI gets to 30. Others might not become diabetic until their BMI gets to 35 or even 40. And some, their BMI can go even higher than that before they get diabetic. Plus also, some of the patients, they really have like you would call diabetes 1.5 with an autoimmune component. And also they're getting, there are a lot of people eating those cooking oils, like a lot of people from India because they eat too much fried food, were getting diabetes and they would still be skinny because they're all starting to match a pattern of like a type 1 diabetic. And insulin can make you fat if insulin's too high. So a type 2 diabetic is hyperinsulinemic. But if somebody has type 1 type features, and a lot of times this late onset type 1 in a sense, they'll call it type 1.5, uh, they can be thin even though they got adult onset diabetes. Okay, here's a list of some things that cause insulin resistance. If you eat excessive dietary fat, saturated fat, any fat will do it, but especially uh, saturated fat like we talked about, perhaps because being saturated with no double bonds, you produce extra electron carriers in the process of beta oxidation um, and the, the sending of extra electron carriers too rapidly to the intermitochondrial membrane overwhelms it. The gradient uh, goes too high. You know, that gradient across the intermitochondrial membrane, which normally should only go up to around uh, negative 160 millivolts. Okay, and so this is described as causing overnutrition, and that will then send a message, you know, to not send the glucose type 4 vesicles up to the plasma membrane within the skeletal muscle cells so they can't take in the glucose, and then you get high blood glucose in the blood after eating postprandial hyperglycemia. Okay, excessive dietary omega 6 fats, partly because they'll make the person obese and all that, but also because. They increase, their metabolism leads to production of some HNE, that's hydroxy non and all. Hydroxy means a hydroxyl group, OH. Non, N-O-N, means nine, nine carbons. Ene means there's a double bond in it, and it's actually hydroxy non enal. Uh, so the A in there is going to mean AL for Al, it's an aldehyde. Okay, anyways, that has, that tends, to, it's a toxic aldehyde, and it'll tend to cause lipid peroxidation chain reactions. And in particular, this is the work of Tetsumori Yamashima, the Japanese neuroscientist. He showed that these will have a tendency to destroy beta cells in the pancreas so that the person will eventually, it happens gradually, 
become diabetic. And this is associated with a dramatic increase in diabetes in Japan. The other thing that hydroxynonanol has been shown to do is to damage uh, hippocampal neurons in your memory center. Gradually it does this, so it makes you stupid. Because that's what he was initially trying to figure out, was why are so many Japanese people becoming demented, you know, of the last couple decades, when that's a relatively new thing. It also damages some of the neurons in the hypothalamus, arcuate nucleus, the hunger center, and that can decrease a person's ability to regulate their appetite and predispose them to overeating and becoming obese. So you don't want to eat omega-6 fats. You really want to avoid them as much as you can. Don't worry about getting deficient in them. It's like impossible to be deficient in these fats if you're just eating a plant-based diet, okay? Any natural choice of plant foods, you're going to get enough. Um, like Nathan Pritikin has said, there is no such thing as a fat deficient diet in any naturally occurring diet, okay? You can't you can't eat plant foods and not get enough of all the fats you need, okay? Um, oh, Nathan Pritikin also said you can't be deficient in protein. And you'll get enough protein. If you're eating just anything you can naturally select of plant foods, you'll get enough protein, you'll get enough fat, and it's a great way to go. And he says not only do you protect yourself from diabetes, but in Nathan Pritikin's research, he showed that you have a 90% reduction in your risk of getting cancer. I mean, what more could you want? This is as good of a deal as it gets in health, okay? And I, I'm a health vegan because it's healthy. I don't, you know, I wish animals well. I don't care about animal rights. I would eat animals if I, if, if it would make me healthier, you know. And I, I would, <laughs> I don't, I don't have a philosophical issue, okay? A lot of people do. You'll see a lot of people. They'll just demonize, demonize saturated fat. And it's really because they're animal rights types and they don't want anybody eating animals. And, you know, animal fat's primarily saturated fat, okay? I just want to be healthy, whatever it'll take to be healthy, okay? So um, I don't eat anything from an animal because it's not good for my health. But it's not because I, I have this giant philosophical issue with it. Okay, um, let's see what else is interesting here. Oh, excessive animal protein. Animal protein itself is intrinsically kind of uh, anabolic, okay? It activates... You know, mTOR, the, the body's growth pathway, cell replication pathway, and in so doing, it elevates cholesterol, elevates blood lipids, and that will predispose to increased risk of diabetes. Um, don't get me wrong. Eating fats, especially saturated fat, is the main risk. That's the dominant one. But all these other things contribute. Now, here's another one you probably don't know about. This one is excessive MSG and MFG. So MSG is monosodium glutamate. MFG is manufactured free glutamate. Okay, so what happened was there was a guy by the name of John Olney, brilliant PhD scientist in the 1960s, and he found that this MSG was incredibly toxic to the brain. And he campaigned in a big way in the 1960s and 1970s that it should be removed. It was in all the baby food. And the reason they put it in the food is because it tastes good and it makes people get addicted to the food. And the food companies love it because they sell more food. And he, he, you know, testified on how bad MSG was and how it causes brain damage and how babies are especially vulnerable because they don't yet have their blood-brain barrier formed. Old people are especially vulnerable as well because they often have additional gaps in their blood-brain barrier from the damage to the tissues by uh, their chronic atherosclerosis from diabetes and hypertension and whatnot. Um, and then the food companies got smart. They wanted the people to eat the foods, and they, they knew they wouldn't buy it if it said MSG on there. So they made up like 50 different names for MSG. And basically, MSG is monosodium glutamate. Mono meaning one, sodium mean Na plus, a salt. It's a salt of glutamate. But it doesn't matter where the glutamate comes from. Anything with glutamate in it is going to excite these. Um, you have taste receptors in your mouth for glutamate. You have taste receptors in your intestinal tract for glutamate. There's bacteria in your gut that especially like glutamate. And to our ancestors, a small amount of glutamate was a good thing. It indicates you've got protein in a food that might be good for you to get some protein. Our ancestors, you know, worried about starving to death. However, what we're basically doing by adding it to a food is overwhelming those taste receptors. And the person can very much become addicted to it. It tastes good. We get these reward neurotransmitters activated when we eat something with more glutamate. Okay, but this really smart lady, and, and by the way, Excitotoxins, The Taste That Kills by Russell Blaylock is an excellent book, and he talks all about MSG and, and about the work of Olney, and it's an excellent book, and he has a good online lecture of that as well. Then I would mention to you this book, uh, Fat, Sick, and Stress. Her book just came out recently. She's had a great TED Talk. Catherine Reed is her name, PhD, and her story was her daughter had autism, and she's real sad and frustrated about her daughter having autism. She's a PhD biochemist. So she started reading everything about autism and going to all the, the family forum groups about autism. And what she learned was some people had a significant improvement when they removed, for example, gluten and casein from their diet. And she wondered why is that the case. 
And you read some guys like that gastroenterologist at Harvard, you know, Fasano, and he's a bright guy, but he'll talk about gluten being irritating to the intestinal tract. And then you say, well, why? And, and here's where her conclusion. The main thing she thinks is the problem with gluten is not so much that it's irritating to the intestinal tract, just that it's called gluten because it's got a lot of glutamate in it. Okay, it's 30% of its amino acids are glutamate. There's about 20, 20, 20 um, different types of essential amino acids, uh, different types of amino acids that make up the proteins that humans eat. Okay, and that's very unusual that a, that a protein of the protein gluten will have 30% of its amino acids being glutamates. That's a lot of glutamates. All right, so what she's saying is if you take that glutamate and you start processing, you heat it, you cook it, you, you break it down into pieces, you blend it or whatever, you now release those glutamates. So they're no longer like a, a, a bunch of beads on a string, like a typical protein. That's what it is, a string of amino acids. They're now free glutamates floating around. And she says, these have a similar effect as MSG. They activate the glutamate taste receptors in our mouth and all along the rest of our intestinal tract, and they make us become addicted to these foods. Um, and so she says that's bad. And casein has a very high percent. I forget the exact amount. I think it was 20%, maybe a little more than that. And so these proteins are specifically chosen for processing because the, the food companies know they don't have to put MSG or anything that sounds like MSG on the label, and they can get tons of glutamate in there and get people addicted to their processed food. Um, and they'll do a whole bunch of other processings. In general, I would never eat one of these protein powders. Like I said, I think a lot of these young guys, they're just so excited about lifting more weight and proud of their high testosterone that they're quite stupid. And they buy these protein powders. I've seen a bunch of young guys in kidney failure from taking too many of these protein uh, powders. And a lot of times they're contaminated with other things. But in addition, she's mentioning that these protein powders are real highly processed and it cranks up the glutamate. It's another reason why some of them will like these, uh, pro these things. She also says there's going to be high glutamates in skim milk, high glutamate in powdered milk. You know, casein is the milk protein, but it's in tons of other foods. There, anything that says ac extract on it, it's probably got a lot of MSG in it. Anything that says hydrolyzed, you know, you hydrolyze the reaction, you break the protein into pieces, that's probably got a lot of MSG in it. Things that are fermented have a lot of MSG in it. So anyways, I, I think her book is fantastic, Fat, Sick, and Stressed. Um, you can watch her TED Talk. she got a great TED Talk. It's on, it, it, just look her up, Catherine Reed. Okay, um, alcohol causes fatty liver, so that's for chumps. I always thought alcohol is a pretty stupid thing to do. I mean, why would you want to, let's get drunk, okay? Why would you want to poison your brain? Stupid. All right. Um, dairy. Dairy is thought to be the cause of type 1 diabetes through an autoimmune reaction, you know, causing leaky gut and then cross molecular mimicry and autoantibody cross-reactivity damaging the pancreas beta cells. F- minus in the water. Uh, is can be associated with uh, increased risk. It also can damage the good gut bacteria, lead to bad gut flora, increasing the risk of uh, leaky gut. Um, and again, excess dietary fat, especially sat fat, is the main cause. But these are things that just contribute to it. So what I'm trying to say is a lot of people, they're having a hard time getting better. And what I'm trying to say is take it an extra step. Take it an extra step and avoid all these other things and you'll have a better chance of getting better. This glyphosate, GP, you know, from Roundup for spraying on the uh, non-organic soy, for example, that thing really uh, promotes fatty liver, according to, you know, the research of Stephanie Seneff. She's got a whole bunch of lectures online all about it. I read her whole book. I don't got it around me right now. It's called Toxic Legacy. It was a great book. It's real detailed, though. I recommend you watch her video lectures first and then read the book if you're still curious, though, because the book goes into it. It's like a biochemistry textbook. I mean, it goes into tons of biochemistry detail. But her lectures are quite good. Um, especially when she has your picture slides. I think you'll find those helpful. And then there's other things, these heavy metals, lead, copper. Uh, also, this atrazine stuff is another estrogenic chemical. Estrogen is a fat storage hormone. When a woman's pregnant, her estrogen goes way up, tells her to gain weight, store that weight. The baby might need it for energy. So all these estrogenic things, and there's tons of them all over the place, they tend to cause weight gain. When you get increased size of your fat cells, they tend to leak uh, fat into the blood that predisposes to insulin resistance. So just becoming fat increases your risk of having type 2 diabetes. Okay, being stressed. When you're stressed, you elevate your cortisol. That causes weight gain and obesity. And you can get you can get diabetes just from cortisol. Okay, stress equivalents, things that are like that also elevate cortisol if you're sleep deprived, if you're drinking caffeine. That's why I think caffeine is so stupid. You got a bunch of people on the internet, I think they're a bunch of BS artists telling people that caffeine is good for you and coffee is good for you. Anytime you have a processed food that's highly profitable commercially, 
There's all these fake industry funded research studies that are going to tell you it's a good. So you'll hear typical stupid people say, oh, stress is bad. I need a cup of coffee. And that's completely stupid. You're just increasing your stress, so to speak. The same hormones go up. Cortisol and catecholamines. And then you see all these people telling you how important sleep is. You know, like there's this one guy online. His name's Matthew Walker. And he seems like a bright guy. And he seems nice. But in my opinion, he's a chicken shit. And here's why I say that. He, he's sitting there telling you how important sleep is, and then he's like, well, it's okay to have some coffee. And why does he do that? I'll tell you why he does that. Because he knows, and I know this from experience, if you criticize coffee, sh your video doesn't get shown, okay? Um, so I don't care. I know I'm already shadow blocked, okay? So I'm just going to tell you the truth. Somebody needs to do it. Coffee is for chumps. Caffeine is for chumps, okay? Once you get off of it, you'll be so glad you did. I quit years ago, and I'm very happy that I did. I felt like, you know... Uh, like I had withdrawal symptoms for a couple of days. I actually felt sad, <laughs> the depletion of some of my brain neurotransmitters, not getting their drug of choice or addiction drug. Okay, and then I had cravings for about two weeks or so, but after that I so I felt so great and I'm so glad to be done with it. Okay, but it's an excitotoxin. All these things have excitotoxin effects, meaning that they increase the metabolic rate of neurons. And then caffeine is also a vasoconstrictor. It lowers the blood supply to your brain, simultaneously increasing brain metabolic rate and lowering... Uh, your blood supply to your brain because it's a vasoconstrictor. Not good. That's stupid. And the older you get, the more fragile you get, so you don't want that. You can get away with a lot of things. When you're 30 years old, you can stay out to 2 o'clock in the morning, get drunk, work the next day at 6 a.m. But when you're over 50, that's not so easy. Okay, uh, what else? All these estrogenic chemicals, and they're all over the place, like the atrazine sprayed on corn to make high fructose corn syrup. All these personal care products typically have estrogenic preservatives in them, the soaps, the shampoos, um, laundry detergent, dishwasher detergent. So you want to really be a minimalist. When I do my dishes, I don't even use uh, dishwasher detergent. When I do my clothes, laundry, I don't use any uh, laundry detergent. You don't need it, okay? Uh, I just run it extra hot, maybe run it extra long, okay? It works fine, okay? I'm, you know, I'm not a fashion guy, obviously, all right? You know, when you're young and single, you know, looking for a wife, you care about every little detail. You don't want a single nose hair sticking beyond the edge of your nose, okay? When you're, when you're a little older, you don't really care. Okay, um, lack of dietary potassium and magnesium. Those are both vasodilators, which would help counteract the effects of vasoconstrictors like sodium, like uric acid, for example. Okay, um, lack of exercise. If you're sedentary, you know, when you're exercising, you increase the GLUT4 uh, transport mobilization in your skeletal muscles to go to the plasma membrane and let glucose in. Okay, you basically do the same thing that insulin would normally do. So getting your exercise really helps. A lot of times when I'm eating, I like to walk around if no one else is home and I can play an audio book or something. It's nice. Okay, um, let's see. Excessive dietary iron, just because you get more oxidative stress. Excessive dietary copper, you get more oxidative stress and that can push things in a negative direction. Okay, circa inhibitors, they'll worsen insulin resistance because they're going to disrupt calcium metabolism. So we're not going to get into all the detail about that, but what I'm trying to say is if um, mitochondrial inhibitors will also increase insulin resistance, like we just talked about, what does the fat do? It inhibits the mitochondria, causes a traffic jam. There's a whole bunch of things that inhibit mitochondria. And then if you've got circa inhibitors, they kind of have a similar effect as inhibiting mitochondria because they overwhelm the cell by letting cytoplasm concentration of calcium go too high, and that starts to damage the mitochondria. Okay. Uh, we're going to get in more of all this calcium stuff later. That's an advanced topic. What I'm kind of doing with this whole book here is these introductory chapters are just building up your knowledge. I'm explaining you stuff so that you'll understand all the more advanced stuff. And if you want, you'll be able to go read the papers and you'll get it. You'll, you'll get the point. And almost none of this stuff is in the medical textbooks. That's partly what this is all about as well. I kind of got a little pissed off that basically being hyper-intelligent is not welcome in medicine. And I see all this stuff. I learn all this stuff. I want to share it with somebody. So I'll make it into a book. And now, of course, my book will never get promoted at all. Like I said, too, I have zero reviews on my book, okay? Some lying BS artist comes out there and tells you to eat a high-fat diet and drink coffee to prevent dementia, you know, and eat estrogenic fat, okay? And they're like, oh, isn't this wonderful? How scientific? It's all BS, you know? All the high-fat phonies, they get invited everywhere, millions of views. They get uh, bestsellers of all their books, okay? Somebody like me comes along and tells you this stuff, I get nothing. But it's okay. I know I'm doing the right thing. And in the long run, I feel better about it, okay? Um, so anyways, mitochondrial inhibitors, there's tons of them. We'll talk about that too. I, 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 there wasn't any mitochondrial. I knew mitochondrial inhibition was a big deal. So I went back to my old biochemistry books from med school, from college. And I have all the new editions of them. I have like five biochemistry textbooks. Okay, and 
There was nothing about these mitochondria inhibitors. And I'm like, holy crap, I know they exist. I started going through the papers, and I found like 50 of them really fast. <laughs> and they're real common things. Statin drugs, okay, antidepressants, uh, serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors, aminoglycoside antibiotics, a lot of really common things. Tylenol, okay, antipsychotics, Haldol and whatnot. Okay, excessive dietary fat, we talked about that. Excessive obesity, just being fat. You're going to get release of the spillover effect of fat going into the blood. We talked about being sedentary. We talked about stress. We talked about stress equivalents. So excessive dietary fructose. I kind of mentioned that a little bit earlier, like about a chapter or two ago. And the deal with that is industrial fructose, not so much fruits. You can eat a lot of fruits, especially if you exercise. There is still the potential to overdo it with fruits. We already talked about that. But in general, especially like processed food uh, with a lot of high fructose corn syrup, but that can be 65% fructose. Uh, relative to the remainder being glucose, and it comes in as a bolus, no fiber. And then the ATP that phosphorylates it then goes to ADP, and it can eventually be made into uric acid that gets into the blood that inhibits enos, endothelial nitric oxide synthase. And when you're vasoconstricted in your skeletal muscles, you can't open up the capillaries to let insulin get in there and do its job. So you get high uh, blood glucose and that's insulin resistance, hyperglycemia. Artificial sweeteners can trick your taste buds and be a bit of a problem. Watch out for stevia. A lot of people think stevia is good. No, it causes infertility. Stay away from it. There's an epidemic off the charts of infertility. I kind of feel sorry for a lot of these young women. They think they're better off than the women were in the past, and they're not. I actually think modern women are screwed, and they don't even realize it. They got such a bad deal. They don't even understand. What I mean by that is I grew up... You know, a long time ago. I was born in the 1960s. I saw what it was like in the 1970s going to all my friends' houses. There were almost no divorces in every house. The mom didn't have to work. And there was plenty of money. She got to spend as much time as she wanted with her children. What makes a woman happy is that her kids are doing okay and she spends time with her kids. That's what I've seen in life. And that lasts for all of life. Modern women, what I've seen is they tend to get brainwashed, you know, that having a job is so important and don't be a loser staying at home with kids. Be a winner. Go get educated and get a job. And I'm like, you know, having a job is not that cool. Having a job, what it means is that you're poor. You have to go work and trade your time for money. Um, you know, if you're wealthy, you've got money. You don't have to work. You don't have to work that much. You can maybe do what you want. Like my mom, she loved she didn't have to work because my dad made plenty of money. And so she just did whatever she liked. She liked playing tennis. She played tennis. She liked uh, architecture. So she was a tour guide at the architecture place, the Frank Clyde Wright place. She liked um, art. So she was a tour guide at the Art Institute. Okay. She liked, you know, children. So she was on the board of directors at an orphanage. Okay. Whatever she wanted to do, she did it because she was wealthy because her husband made money for her. And so what I'm trying to say is that's having a good. I would love to have somebody pay my bills so I could just do what I want. No, I have to work uh, because I'm not that wealthy. You know, my family spends all my money. All I buy is a couple of books. You saw the video about my life. I, anyways, I'm not even going to get into that right now. But what I'm trying to say is um, there's an off the charts increased incidence of infertility. And I think a lot of these young women, they go to school, school, school forever. And then by the time they decide they want to have a baby, they're in their 30s and they can't have it. I've seen a lot of very nice, very pretty female doctors. No husband, no kids. And it looks like they never will have one, okay? And I've heard a lot of weird stories, too. I have friends, you know, that are real good-looking guys. And they sometimes go out with these women because the women like to have a boyfriend, you know, a part-time boyfriend, almost like they're paying the guy to be their, their boyfriend. It's, it's kind of pathetic and sad. But I think they're a lot worse off than they used to be. Um, it's very hard now that one person can work and this other spouse don't have to work. And they're having fewer kids. And the kids bring happiness. And there's a whole bunch of other things. We're not going to get into all that right now. Okay, what else? Uh, magnesium deficiency because you don't eat plants. Potassium deficiency because you don't eat plants. Um, these things in the air pollution, there's a lot of uh, AL, you know, aluminum, and that um, is toxic to the pancreas, and it ends up being, a, it's a metalloestrogen. It ends up being associated with obesity, insulin resistance, diabetes. We talk about mitochondrial toxins. Okay, so... Anything that's making you fat or inhibiting your mitochondria is going to increase your chance of becoming diabetic. And what I'm also saying is, you know, this, ins this low-fat vegan diet, it's like, what more could you want? When I was an um, intern, I did a surgical internship, I had to consent to all the patients for the big surgeries. You know, I would consent them for open-heart surgery. Oh, yeah, sure, where do I sign, you know, for a craniotomy, you know, resection of a benign brain tumor like a meningioma. Oh, sure, where do I sign? No big deal. They're always happy to sign the consent. 
And then you tell them, okay, we got to go vegan. Oh, no, I'm not ready for that. Patient will sign a consent for chemotherapy, craniotomy, open heart surgery in two seconds. But you tell them you got to go vegan. Oh, I'm not ready for that, you know. And every morning in front of every Western hospital, there's like this river of patients of fat, diabetic, hypertensives that flow in for a million different tests. And, you know, well, how many of them ever go low-fat vegan? One in 100,000, okay? And that's why they never get better. Okay, you know, it's like, thank God something works. I wish I'd known about this a long time ago. And it's never going to get taught to doctors. It's never going to get into the medical textbooks. It's never going to be taught in the medical schools, the dietitian schools, or anywhere. Because if patients learn how to empower themselves and cure themselves, then they don't need the healthcare system that much. Healthcare system loses money. So it's not going to let that happen. And not many people are bright enough to learn on their own, okay? It's just a fact of life. And what they do is they exhaust these young people, these young trainees and all the healthcare professions. They work the crap out of them. They test the crap out of them. So they're so tired and exhausted, by the time they get a free moment to read something for pleasure, they're in their mid to late 30s, then they're having their babies and they're up late at night, they're trying to make partner at their job and they're working them, you know, till they drop over exhausted. So they've lost all their energy, time and curiosity. Forget it. They never read their whole life. I know tons of them. That's what it's like. Okay, so I don't see things ever changing. That's why as an individual, you need to learn this for yourself to protect your, your health. Okay, um, I'm just going to show a couple other things uh, that are not as well known. So here is pancreatic islet cell necrosis due to oral aluminum. So aluminum is in a lot of stuff. It's in the water. They put it in the drinking water as a clarifier. It's another reason why you want a water purifier. This is routinely done. It makes the water look more clear, even though you're basically poisoning it with aluminum, okay? <laughs> it causes beta cell necrosis. And that's routinely in people's tap water, okay? This is a routine thing. That's why a lot of people, you know, they don't even know what happened to themselves. They're, they're all sick and messed up. All right. Okay, this is just talking about, uh, this is just a paper showing how artificial sweeteners uh, increase insulin resistance, tricking the pancreas, excess insulin is released, okay, and they protect themselves. They learn to protect themselves by having insulin resistance. So the reason I'm doing this is I'm just trying to show it. And I'll tell you the conclusion I came to is that you want to avoid almost all, just become a minimalist. Be a really simple person because that gives you a lot of strength and a big improvement in your health, okay? Um, and that also is a great secret of achievement, you know, and that's what I learned from my wrestling coaches. And I told you like world and Olympic champion, Mark Schultz, he basically said to me, he says, the only thing I own right now is my motorcycle and it's a piece of crap, but I don't care because all my energy is focused on becoming a world champion. He became world and Olympic champion. And I've seen that in other great athletes and other great achievers. Simplify your life. You don't need all this processed food. You don't need all these personal care products. You don't need all these soaps and detergents. And there's a resilience that comes from not having all this crap around. Like I, like I told you, if you go into my bathroom, there's nothing there. There's like one transparent bar of soap with the fewest possible ingredients. I don't use any shampoo. I mean, I don't got much hair, but I don't need anything. All right. Whereas you go in my wife's bathroom, there's like 55, I counted them, 55 personal care products. I said, what are you doing? You're putting all this stuff on yourself and you know, you're, you're going to potentially make yourself sick. There's all kinds of estrogenic other chemicals in there. She's like, you don't understand a woman. She would rub shit on her face if she thought it would make her look pretty. I go, well, that's what you're basically doing. And then she said, ah, oh, you're just jealous because you look old, you got wrinkles and she, she knows all these wrinkle procedures, you know, for anyways, we're not going to get into all that, but I'm just saying is you don't need all that stuff. All right. It's not going to help you. All right, uh, adding salt to meals, a risk factor for type 2 diabetes. Okay, after adjusting for possible confounders, there's a twofold increased risk of diabetes in people who added salt to their prepared meals. <laughs> okay, without even tasting it. Okay, so anyways, um, salt gets you to overeat, just like MSG does. It gets you to overeat processed food. Well, even if it's not that processed, you just added salt. It makes it worse, okay? All right, so what's this one now? Serum and uh, potassium and the risk of incident type 2 diabetes. Okay, so if you're hypokalemic, low in potassium, or if you're eating too much sodium, you increase your risk of diabetes. All right. Yeah, when you're stressed out, you pee out your magnesium too, and you can become magnesium deficient from that as well. And caffeine gets you to pee out more of your magnesium, the vasodilator. So these things counteract that vasoconstriction effect of sodium and uric acid. Okay, dietary salt and sodium. Uh, if you decrease uh, sodium in your diet, it's associated with lowering your hemoglobin A1C. Okay. So this is another thing too is, you know, a lot of nutrition experts, they're just trying to get the average person who's not that motivated to be reasonably healthy. Where I'm coming from is, what's the best you could do? I always think you should try to do the best you can. The reason is, 
when you go from just doing okay to doing your best, a lot of times good things happen in that interval and they're worth going for. And, and a lot of people who might have failed with just a reasonable effort will be successful with a big effort. So why not? Why not be the best you could be? And, you know, it's not that big of a difference to just be reasonably okay versus be the best you can be. Um, Okay, so, you know, more of the same type of stuff. Effective magnesium deficiency. on, And the reason I'm going through all this is there are some people having a hard time turning around their type 2 diabetes. And what I'm basically saying is here's a whole bunch of things you can do, like incrementalism. Add all these steps to optimizing your insulin sensitivity, and you might be able to turn the corner. Maybe you just haven't pushed hard enough. You've reduced your fat, but you haven't optimized these other things. So here it is. And a lot, like I said, there's a lot of good things that happen. Uh, hyperinsulinemia also increases sympathetic autonomic nervous system. You can get yourself into a vicious cycle. Okay, endocrine disruptors and plastics. Yeah, you want to store your water. Let's say you bring water, bottled water to work with you in the daytime. You know, put it in glass would be best or stainless steel, second best. Avoid these plastic containers if you can. You know, a lot of times that bottled water has been sitting on a hot truck outgassing or in a hot warehouse outgassing for weeks or months. Um, and then it's in full contact with the plastic. And these things are pretty toxic. You know, the BPAs, the phthalates, etc. They're associated with increased risk of diabetes, obesity. BPA is also a you know, mitochondrial inhibitor. They increase your risk of cancer. Okay. Oh, here's another one here too. The PFOA, so per P fluoro octanoic acid. And this is thing like nonstick cookware. You don't want to use these nonstick cookwares, okay? These fluoride polymers, they get into your blood potentially and they're neurotoxic. They're toxic to mitochondria and they can be toxic to your pancreatic beta cells. You don't want them. The other thing too is a lot of people want one plus one equals two. You just, they want one simple cause and one simple thing to do, but that's not how it, is, how it is. There's a whole bunch of little things. You're getting nickel and dimed all over the place and you want to put out all these little problems, put out all these little fires and uh, get yourself the best possible result. In order to fix the problem, you have to know what the problem is. So awareness of the problem is the first step to fixing it. And so you have to learn how to become aware of this stuff. And that's why I'm giving this lecture here. Okay, obstructive sleep apnea is real common. And I will look at the charts of these obstructive sleep apnea patients. And I'll see them sometimes dropping their oxygen saturations into the 60s at night. So if you drop your oxygen saturation into the 60s, what that means is you've got a metabolic rate in your neuron. Let's say it's right here. And now you drop the oxygen or you drop the glucose delivery to it, the oxygen delivery to it, or you're dropping the stats to 68%. So you're dropping the oxygen delivery to it. If you get these things too far apart, the metabolic rate of that neuron versus the oxygen and glucose delivery, you're going to start losing neurons to apoptosis. They're dying. That's my Peter Rogers theory of neurovascular uncoupling. That normally they're coupled. The amount of oxygen and glucose delivery is coupled to the metabolic rate of that neuron, and they should stay about the same. And we've got some reserve. Like if all you did was just have one cup of coffee, raising your metabolic rate, dropping your oxygen and glucose delivery, you'd be able to handle that probably pretty well. But then you superimpose on that a high-fat meal with a lot of sodium. Um, you're stressed out. You're sleep deprived. All of a sudden, this gap keeps getting bigger and bigger. And pretty soon you're going to start losing brain cells due to apoptosis, lack of oxygen and glucose delivery to that neuron. It can't meet its metabolic demand, so it just recycles itself. Program cell death, apoptosis. Okay, uh, let's see what else. That means like the falling off of a leaf, like the Greek word. In the past, diabetics would only check their blood sugar like, let's say, about two, three times a day by sticking their finger with a needle. They'd have no idea what their blood glucose was at night. But nowadays, they got these CGMs, Continuous Glucose Monitors, and they will check their blood glucose. They can check their blood glucose, get a printout of what happened every 30 minutes all through the night. And they start finding out, gee, a lot of them are much more hypoglycemic than they thought at night. And remember, it's much more dangerous to be hypo than hyperglycemic in general. Because when you're hypoglycemic, man, you can injure brain cells or in the daytime, if you're doing something, you could pass out or, you know, stuff like that. Okay, what's normal hemoglobin A1C? You normally want it uh, less than 5.5. And you normally want your fasting blood sugar less than 100. Okay, for prediabetics, that's when you have a hemoglobin A1C greater than 5.5. Uh, in a fasting blood glucose, you know, 100 to 126. True diabetes diagnosed when the hemoglobin A1C gets over 6.5 or the fasting blood sugar, blood glucose gets over 126. Hemoglobin A1C over 7 is considered, you know, relatively poorly controlled diabetes. So sleep apnea patients are notoriously cognitively slow and they're at increased risk for dementia. Okay, and the smart move is try to cure it by becoming a low-fat vegan, okay? 
And by the way, I didn't come to low-fat vegan willingly. I, I used to think vegans were a bunch of, you know, wimpy, you know, soy boy, sandal wearing, you know, hippies, tie-dye shirts, you know, just, you know, I had zero respect for them, okay? But I just found out it's what makes you healthy. So I didn't come to this, you know, caring about animals or anything else. I just wanted to have open arteries, okay? I went through a brief fat phase and I did not like it. Okay, so we talked about the deletory theory of the mouse equivalents, okay? Um, we're going to get into that in more detail later. All right, okay, now getting back to how diabetes damages the brain. Yeah, when you've got diabetes, well, first of all, let's talk about a normal, a normal capillary in your brain. The job of the arteries is deliver oxygen and glucose to your brain cells. Okay, so here's your red blood cells. They fold back on themselves a little bit, going through a capillary. That's because they're a little bigger than the capillary. Red blood cells are about seven microns. Capillary is about five microns. That's worth knowing. Okay, and then when they pass through, as they deform, they contact the edges of the capillary, and these little blue circles are the oxygen being, being delivered to the neuron, the brain cell. Okay, and this is the yellow line is the capillary basement membrane. The endothelial cells, the lining cells of the capillary, the arterial system, they attach to the basement membrane. Just outside of them is muscle cells. You know, throughout the body, these are called vascular smooth muscle cells. In the brain, they'll often call them pericytes, okay? Um, P-E-R-I, pericytes, C-Y-T-S, it's, you know, as a cell. Okay, so anyways, with chronic hypertension, you get hypertrophy of the vascular smooth muscle cells. You get an increase in number of the vascular smooth muscle cells, thickening the wall of the vessel. It's like the cell's protecting itself from the high pressure. So in response to injury. With diabetes, you get thickening of the capillary basement membrane, glycation of the capillary basement membrane. It becomes thicker. You can see how the yellow capillary basement membrane here is thicker than it is up here. You can see how there's more of these green uh, vascular smooth muscle cells than there were over here. So the net result of all this, you know, the sequela of injury to capillaries and arteries by hypertension and diabetes is that less oxygen is delivered from the red blood cell to the neuron. So that's just a, a baseline damage to the, the vessels, the tubular delivery system of oxygen and glucose. So that's strike one, okay? And then strike two would be a high-fat meal. A high-fat meal in and of itself can drop oxygen in Google's delivery about 15 20%, okay? And then you throw in extra sodium. Then you throw in caffeine, sleep deprivation, stress, okay? Um, all of these things are dropping your ability to deliver oxygen and glucose to those brain cells. So you're going to risk that those brain cells uh, become damaged. And if you simultaneously are doing that and you're stressed out and sleep deprived, you're just weakening yourself. And then you're opening up voltage-gated calcium channels through EMF. Um, all of those things are pushing you towards apoptosis of brain cells. So you don't want that. So this is a very important point. The longer you have poorly controlled diabetes and hypertension, the more you're going to damage uh, these vascul vessel walls. And if you overtreat the hypertension too, then you're screwed as well because you, the reason why you have high blood pressure is to get blood to the top of your brain. And the pumping pressure had to go up probably because you're eating a high-fat diet. The blood's thick. It increases blood viscosity, blood thickness. So you, it takes more pressure to pump a milkshake up to the top than pump water up to the top. And then if you constrict the system because of the sodium, then the vessels are narrowed. Again, you got to pump at a higher pressure to get the same volume and the same amount of time through those vessels. Just like pushing your finger over the, the, the tip of a hose when you're you know washing your car or something, okay? So you see, it's these, all these things are adding up. That's why I gave that metaphor of you know the last straw that broke the camel's back. You don't want to keep on adding straws to the camel's back. That means bad health habits that are going to potentially cause you to hit a threshold point and then start having an irreversible defect of some kind, heart attack, stroke, or whatever. That's one of the whole key points in this whole book is learning how to recognize what's damaging your health so you can avoid it before it causes irreversible damage. Okay. All right, so here's another key point about diabetes. And again, you can't learn this reading conventional medical books. Conventional medical books, they're all at least 50 years out of date. They're pretty routinely 100 years out of date. Like I said, they had figured out in the 1920s 
that high fat diet is what causes insulin resistance and that's still not in any of the medical textbooks okay <laughs> that's information is from about a hundred years ago okay all right now here's another thing that's not in the medical textbooks it's in all the why do i know it's true it's in all the research papers but it's not in the medical textbooks in the medical textbooks you'll read that there's glucose type 1 transporters for glucose at the bbb blood brain barrier those enable glucose to travel from the blood across the blood brain barrier into the brain parenchyma okay then you'll also read there are glucose type 3 transporters on the wall of the neurons the brain cells that enable glucose to move into the brain cell okay that's wonderful but what they don't tell you is that you also have glucose type 4. So glucose type 1 and glucose type 3, glucose transporters, they are not dependent on insulin. They function independent of insulin. So whatever's happening with insulin doesn't matter to them. However, you also have glucose type 4. Those are the ones that sit in a cytoplasmic vesicle and they wait for a signal from insulin to be sent up to the plasma membrane so they can then form a channel that will allow glucose into the cell. Well, you also have those and you need those in your hippocampus and areas of your cerebral cortex, for example. And so when you've got insulin resistance in the body, you've got insulin resistance in the brain, and you're not able to get as much glucose as you want into these neurons, and that can become a big deal. Remember, what's the purpose of a brain? To walk down a path in a forest or jungle or a prairie and to survive. And you see a couple coyotes, you see trouble coming at you, you got to react fast, fight or flight. That's what the stress response is really for, to make you survive the next 15 minutes. Do you fight? Do you stand your ground? Do you climb a tree? What are you going to do? Okay, and basically... If you can't, you need to get a lot more glucose into those brain cells and into all your muscle cells fast. And if you have a lot of insulin resistance, you can't do it. Okay, so it makes you stupider. And if, and if you crank up that metabolic rate of that neuron too much and you're not able to get enough glucose into it, you can also lose that neuron and go into apoptosis. Program cell death from those neurons. You don't want that. Not good. Okay, and that's a big part of also why I wrote this book, because in my opinion, the conventional books are just completely stupid. They tell you stuff like, oh, Alzheimer's, you know, the main cause of dementia is Alzheimer's, and Alzheimer's is a process where you have increased extracellular senile plaques with beta amyloid protein, and you have intracellular increased neurofibrillary tangles. And you sit there and you're like, okay, good, so what? What does that make me do to change my behavior? You don't know what to do when you hear that information. And then they tell you, well, if you got ApoE4, you're especially screwed, and your risk of Alzheimer dementia goes way up. But then you look closely, and I already told you in the beginning of this, like in the first chapter, Alzheimer's is BS, okay? They can't diagnose this by historical finding, by physical finding, by laboratory exam, by imaging, or even at autopsy. And then they have no treatment for it, okay? What a bunch of crap that is. But what I can tell you is, Delatore is correct in his theory, okay? And my theory is correct too, a neurovascular uncoupling, okay? Delatore's theory is also called the vascular hypothesis of dementia. It's a variation on it. It's the best version of the vascular hypothesis. There's all those little nuance. My neurovascular uncoupling hypothesis is basically an expanded, you know, better informed version of the old calcium hypothesis, okay? So here's an additional thing known to it. Because all the PhDs that typically did a lot of the early work, they did some great work, but they weren't able to put it all together, include all the nutrition and the toxins and all the other issues, what's happening with the blood-brain barrier, etc. Okay, so anyways, here's another thing I want to show you why diabetics are so stupid. And the, the notoriously stupidest patients, if you, if you talk to doctors off the record, who will they tell you are the stupidest patients? Number one is going to be your kidney failure patients. The patients on dialysis, I feel sorry for them, but they tend to have very, very slow cognitive function, okay? Then the next most common group, the obstructive sleep apnea patients are often very slow. They're like falling asleep when they're talking to you, and you're not saying they're necessarily slow, but because they keep falling asleep, they can't hold a conversation with you a lot of them, okay? like a narcolepsy effect almost a lot of them. And then the diabetics. The diabetics, as they're getting older, they're just notoriously really cognitively slow with a lack of insight. I can't tell you how many diabetics I've talked to with amputated toes or feet, and they're, oh, I'm doing fine. Everything's fine. Yeah, right. That means they don't know what's going on. Plus, the typical diabetic, the law will tell you, everything's under control. It's under control. It's under control. I'm taking my pills. It's under control. They don't even know what they're talking about. They're just getting sicker and sicker because they're not addressing the issue, which is the insulin resistance. They're only focusing on their blood glucose levels, and that's not what diabetes is really all about. It's about insulin resistance, and you really want to prevent the insulin resistance. That's the path to health because if you've got high insulin resistance, even if you've got a normal blood glucose level, you're still at higher risk for stroke, for dementia, and for a whole bunch of other problems. Okay, so here's an additional problem in these diabetic brain cells. All right, so we talked about how you need glucose type 4 transporters to get as much glucose as you, as you want and need into that brain cell, 
okay? And these glucose type 4 transporters are blocked from going up to the plasma membrane because of insulin resistance, overnutrition, all right? And that's what this red line represents, blockage of the glucose, transfor glucose type 4 transporters, insulin-dependent ones, from getting up to the plasma membrane. And this is showing the glucose molecules bouncing off the plasma membrane here. So the insulin might bind the receptor, but it's not able to effectively signal the glucose type 4 transporters to get up to that plasma membrane. And here's why it's relevant. The brain has to, you know, you're walking down a, a path in a forest or a jungle, and all of a sudden, oh crap, there's a bunch of coyotes. What am I going to do? Okay, they're coming towards me. Oh shit, I got to think fast. I got to move fast. So your brain cells have to go from zero to 100 miles per hour fast, in a, you know, in like a second, okay? So the brain needs a way to ramp up its intensity of activity and thought very, very fast. And one of the ways it does it is there are things inside of brain cells, inside of your neurons, called MAMs. And these are mitochondrial-associated membranes where the endoplasmic reticulum has attachment points with your mitochondria. And the endoplasmic reticulum, you know, you look at a, a textbook, they'll show you this one little tiny thing, they'll draw it in a corner, okay? But that's not what it's really about. The endoplasmic reticulum is kind of like all over the place in a cell with these finger-like amoeboid extensions, all right? And it has contact points with the mitochondria. By the way, you can have thousands of mitochondria in a cell, all right? So anyways, it'll have connection to a mitochondria, and these connection points, the MAMs, mitochondria-associated membranes, at this site, when there's a sudden ramping up of intensity of activity and thought, it will release calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum has a storage, it's a reservoir of calcium. It will release calcium into the mitochondria, and they go right into the mitochondrial matrix, and those rapidly will upregulate. That means rapidly increase your uh, Krebs cycle enzymes. And the reason for that is you want to really quickly generate a whole bunch of electron carriers and get that mitochondria moving. It's like, go, 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 all systems go, okay? And so you have to do that fast. And what I'm saying happens here is normally our ancestors, they just took it for granted that we never had insulin resistance. We didn't need high fat diets. So they just assumed when it was time to get going fast, the glucose would be there. You didn't have to worry about it. The glucose would be there. But they're not that well coupled. So when you need to ramp up your activity real fast, the endoplasmic reticulum starts pumping calcium into the mitochondria. But because of the insulin resistance that the person is eating a high-fat diet and whatnot and it has other reasons for insulin resistance, the glucose can't get there. And so now you pump all this calcium into the mitochondria matrix and it starts to damage the mitochondria when the concentration of calcium in the mitochondria matrix goes too high. And there's not something for it to do. There's not enough glucose in electron carriers being produced uh, and so that will damage the mitochondria, and it can cause the cell to die and go into apoptosis. So this is part of the reason why, too, you don't want to stress out your diabetic elderly people in your family. They can't handle it. So who wants to go through life becoming progressively stupid just because of your own stupidity when this is a fixable problem? Some things in life, you can't fix them, okay? All right, uh, let's see. Okay, so that's all I've got for um, this chapter. Uh, so this was the chapter we just talked about today was uh, chapter 8B on diabetes. And the key points were realizing that diabetes is a major cause of brain damage. The fastest, best way you could avoid it is minimizing your intake of fat. And this is why it's always going to be a low-fat diet. And I tell you, all types of fat will increase your risk of diabetes, even beloved olive oil, okay? They're going to tend to make you become fat, have more hyperlipidemia. So that's another reason why I say, you know, people telling you to prevent dementia by eating high-fat diets with all this nonsense about olive oil, omega-3s, and soy is really high-fat too. It's like 40% fat. It's almost like a meat. Soy of all the foods is very much like a meat. And by avoiding all these things, you can dramatically lower your risk of diabetes, and in so doing, you're dramatically lowering your risk of cognitive impairment. So it's good to know all that. It's good to know all the things. And, you know, and caffeine and coffee, they also cause, increase your blood lipids. I mean, you simulate the fight or flight response. You crank up your blood glucose and your blood lipids because you think you're going to need those for a sudden physical movement. It's, acute stress response is all about surviving the next 15 minutes. But in the modern world, we get psychologically stressed or sleep deprived and you have that effect going on for hours and hours or people drinking coffee and or tea and accentuating it okay so anyways uh, i hope that's helpful to you